All right, well, our speakers are coming up. I can get started. So we're moving to theme three, knowledge bases for predictive genomic medicine. So the framing question here is, what do we need to know to tell any patient their risk of disease based on genomic testing? So a couple of ideas or areas that have come up in uh, previous input uh, from our strategic planning sessions have been around uh, knowledge bases um, for establishing the clinical relevance of variants. We have the NHGRI-supported ClinGen, but what other data types are needed? What other knowledge bases are needed for us to be able to really um, get at this question? Uh, a counterpart to these knowledge bases would be um, improving or developing new algorithms or tools for interpreting a set of variants identified in a patient, also for predicting risk for that individual or set of individuals. And then lastly, thinking about worldwide networks for generating and sharing knowledge from diverse populations so these knowledge bases are better representative uh, for all people and not just on one subset of the population. So that's sort of where we're starting from. And we have our speakers. So we've got Juan Rodriguez Flores, Katrina Goddard, Iftikhar Kulu, Lisa Bastarch, and Jillian Hooker is our moderator. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for, ha for inviting me to uh, present here. And um, I'm going to talk about some research that we've done, uh, funded in part uh, when I was a postdoc at, uh, funded by the NHG or NHLBI, and also uh, work that we've done. At Cornell, we have a medical school here in New York City in the US, and one in uh, Qatar. And we've been collaborating on projects funded by um, the Qatar Foundation. Um, so anyway, so uh, the question is, what do we need to know in order to tell any un unaffected uh, Hispanic couple the risk of recessive genetic disease in, this, in their children? And uh, in practice, this is called carrier screening. So you, have, uh, you want genomic data for both parents. Um, and you can determine if the parents are both carriers for a genetic, uh, a, 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 a genetic disease, which means in, in a classical Mendelian sense, there's a one in four chance that a child will have, get both uh, 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 risk alleles and, and have the disease. So one example is uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. A lot of people here are familiar with that. And so what we would like to have is a knowledge base of all the Hispanic risk alleles, for example. Um, and you know, the reason that, uh, there's an issue in, in terms of, uh, uh, I say specifically Hispanic risk alleles, is because the, the risk alleles differ across populations. So every human population will have a different risk allele. For example, the uh, all-known uh, cystic fibrosis risk alleles are, are mutations in the CFTR gene. So the CFTR mutation in port that's found in Puerto Rico differs uh, from the one that's found in, let's say, in Qatar. Um, and if you are doing genetic screening uh, based on an array, you need to have the, the, the mutations already known and, 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 and genotype on that array. So let's say uh, a, a man from Puerto Rico goes to the World Cup in Qatar a few years from, from now, has a great time, meets this beautiful woman, uh, Arab woman there, convinces her to come back to the US and mar get married and have children. Uh, and so they get uh, uh, carrier screening, uh, but the, the mutations that are on the screening panel are the ones that are observed in the US, including Puerto Rico, uh, but not the ones that are observed in Qatar. So you would get a false negative for the mother, saying the mother doesn't have a risk allele that's previously observed in the US. And so you, would, you could potentially have a, a child affected with um, uh, cystic fibrosis. Okay. okay, so why should the NHGRI do it? Um, I'm sp specifically focusing on Hispanics, not just because I'm Hispanic, uh, but because it is the largest non-white minority among 1.8 million U.S. newborns. That's about a quarter of them are, are uh, Hispanic. Okay, um, and there is a well-documented uh, gap in existing knowledge bases of Hispanic risk variants. So this is uh, uh, an, ar uh, an article by Pope Joy et al. where they looked at risk alleles across different uh, ethnic groups and the majority that are known are, are in uh, p individuals of European ancestry or whites. Um, and um, only about 10% of them are, are in Hispanics. Okay, and also in a w work that we, we 
presented uh, a few months ago at Biology of Genomes is that Hispanic risk variants are population specific. So you can't just say Hispanic says this is just one homogenous group of Spanish speaking people. Um, so if you compare uh, 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 two different U.S. Hispanic populations, this is Thousand Genomes Project data. So. You know, there's four different Hispanic groups in 1,000 genomes. Two were sampled out in, in Latin, in outside of the U.S., and two were sampled in the U.S., being Mexicans in Los Angeles and, um, and Puerto Ricans in, in Puerto Rico. And what we found is that uh, the vast majority of the risk variants are population specific. So you see them only in, in Mexicans or only in Puerto Ricans, but not both. And when you, you focus on the pathogenic ones, that's 94% uh, of them, okay? So why has it not been done? Uh, so one is that prior knowledge bases focus on high risk populations of homo homo uniform ancestry, okay? And recent advances have enabled the development of knowledge bases for populations of mixed ancestry, okay? And use them in the design of genomic uh, medicine technology as, uh, you know, myself and colleagues have been doing in Qatar, which is actually much more diverse uh, population than was initially expected. So, and for example, what you can do if you took uh, 1,000 Genomes Project data, and you uh, looked at the genetic uh, diversity in that population here in this principal components analysis, um, which is basically sort of collapses all genetic variation into two dimensions, one dimension being uh, up, up and down, being from African, Sub-Saharan African to European, and left to right being from European to East Asian. And then we run some machine learning algorithms on the data, and we can it, it cluster people based on uh, their most likely ancestry. Each color is a different ancestry. And then we can say for each individual Hispanic, are they predominantly of Native American ancestry, predominantly of European ancestry, or predominantly of African ancestry? So labeled in black in these three different plots. And then we'd redo the analysis that we had done before, except instead of grouping people as uh, uh, um, Mexican or Puerto Rican, now we're grouping them based on the ancestry that we've inferred from their genome, and we still see the same trend, where over 80% of the risk alleles are observed only within one ancestry, and almost none of them are shared across all three different ancestries. Okay, uh, and I, I stuck the three slides, so, but thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, my idea is to focus on improving knowledge bases on the consequences of genetic risk information that is available in unselected populations. And I think the reason this hasn't been done yet is because in the past, most people who had um, genetic testing actually had signs and symptoms of the condition. And so we're just really getting to the point going forward um, where we will have more unselected individuals who are receiving this testing um, either as secondary findings or in population screening programs or even in direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Um, and so I think we need to harness this information that is coming from both research studies as well as from clinical care, um, which I think is going to be harder to capture that information. Um, and as Heidi mentioned earlier today, we also need to think about expanding what is the phenotypic spectrum that's associated with these variants. Um, we also heard from Les earlier today about the need to be balancing the risks and harms um, with the benefits. And I think this is really an important piece of what are the harms, what are the chances that that harmful outco outcome is going to happen. Um, and in unselected populations, we probably have a lower um, risk for harm than what we currently understand from uh, the clinical populations that we know about today. So I think this is really important for us to get better estimates of penetrance. 
Um, the second thing is looking at the effectiveness of the medical interventions earlier in the course of disease. So if we know this information sooner, um, can we actually do something about it and are those interventions effective? And I think that there are um, well-known examples in cancer screening, for instance, where we thought doing the screening was going to be effective, and it turned out that when you look at the balance of risks and harms, um, that maybe it's not the best idea to do the screening. So for instance, um, PSA screening in prostate cancer or uh, mammography screening for women in their 40s. And so uh, just to use an example from uh, ClinGen, um, let's see. Um, so in one of the reports that we looked at in ClinGen in pulmonary arterial, arterial hypertension, um, the evidence was from a systematic review of 37 studies that had been conducted involving over 4,000 patients. And they were assessing uh, drug treatment in adults with this condition and found inconclusive evidence for mortality reduction. And so this is just an example um, showing that sometimes the, the thing that we, when we think that intervention is going to be effective, when we actually do the studies um, and then look at mortality in those populations, um, it didn't actually turn out the way that we thought it was going to. And so from the, the ClinGen working group, we actually um, scored this as having um, a high degree of evidence, a high level of evidence, but actually a low effectiveness of this intervention. Um, and so finally, the, the third thing is not really my area of expertise, but it's something that I still feel is very important um, for us to understand the consequences of genomic risk information is to be able to look at the functional consequences for variants of uncertain uh, significance. And there are just so many variants that are present in these genes, um, and it is going to be quite a task to look at each and every one of them and figure out what those functional consequences are. And I think the development of large-scale assays and approaches that can be systematically applied to all of the variants in the genes um, in order to um, get some estimate of what those consequences might be uh, is a really important tool for us going forward as one line of evidence in order to understand these variants. So thank you. So I wanted to preface my talk by two statements. Firstly, um, risk prediction is the fulcrum of the practice of medicine. Patients come to physicians wanting to know their risk of disease and what they can then do together to reduce that risk of disease. The second point is that risk prediction algorithms currently do very poorly. And I can cite the example of the risk prediction algorithm for coronary heart disease, which we use uh, very commonly in clinical practice, but in a study where patients had an event and they went retrospectively and calculated the, uh, the risk, only half of the, these individuals were actually at risk of uh, having a heart attack. So I think the NHGRI has an enormous opportunity uh, by um, uh, focusing on risk prediction with genetics, uh, particularly polygenic risk scores, because uh, they are probably relevant to every single individual. And so I think I just used two examples here. Uh, from my practice, uh, and I think much of the discussion today is probably relevant, but if you take uh, heart attack risk, we use conventional risk scores, and I just pointed out that they do poorly. It's almost like a flip of a coin in some sense. And you can layer on the polygenic risk scores, but where we need information is how relevant are current polygenic risk scores for different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, what is the role of family history? Uh, from our work and from the work of others, the, it seems that PRS and family history are independent. They're very important, both of them, but are independent uh, contributors. And I think in the future, or maybe uh, even now, there's a lot of uh, role scope for uh, environmental measures, which we should not ignore, but which haven't traditionally been in risk prediction equations. And then, of course, in the future, more big data. Uh, but the question is, how do you integrate it? And that's where I think guidelines and professional bodies are a bit hesitant because they don't know how to layer this on to 50 years, 60 years of work in Framingham. And so 
What might be useful is if you had some prospective multi-ethnic cohorts where you have this information and you have events, and then you can actually take these factors together to, to estimate the regression coefficients, and you'd be very comfortable then using that in the clinical arena. And then, uh, again, this has been alluded to, uh, uh, is that we should never consider these risk estimates static, and, and these may change with time. But this may set the stage for the thinking of how we might be able to put this into practice, because I think we will see some barriers related to some of these questions from professional bodies. The next one is, um, and this was a question asked, what is it we need to tell patients about the risk of monogenic disease? And of course, as you know, there's a huge range in how a pathogenic variant can, can uh, vary in terms of penetrance and expression. If you take the case of FH, there's a large number of people, uh, a proportion of individuals, particularly women, who ha live their lives completely free of symptoms and live long lives. And so they have very high levels of cholesterol, but it doesn't um, express. And so um, I think that's a point we need to make uh, as well. But uh, just these two scenarios when we are looking at pathogenic variants is the screening uh, uh, situation and then the, where there's an indication-based testing. And uh, here we are uh, essentially uh, looking at this uh, in research setting without much of phenotypic information. And this is something we have encountered in eMERGE. And it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon where we, as the investigators, then grapple with how to return these results if the phenotype, for example, is very convincing, but the genetic result was negative or, or vice versa. In the, uh, in the clinical situation, uh, you will get VUSs from clinical labs. And then the question is, uh, the physician puts these findings into the clinical context and manages the patient accordingly. And uh, so this is a little bit of a different situation. But again, we need uh, much more information, as Katrina alluded to. And uh, some of these resources are uh, very helpful, uh, particularly ClinWar from, uh, so sponsored by the NHGRI. And then, of course, shared databases uh, might also, uh, sharing these data might also help. But even when we know a variant is pathogenic, we have to grapple with penetrance, expression, and then what to do in terms of surveillance and, and cascade testing. So these are, I think, important questions when we deal with pathogenic variants in these two settings, the indication-based and the population screening-based. So I think where uh, NHGRI could contribute is uh, to help uh, develop methods for uh, uh, robust PRSs, validating them and applying them in the clinical setting. I think eMERGE 4 is supposed to do some of that. Uh, how do we uh, annotate variants in a very robust manner and have resources to follow individuals' cohorts that have these variants over time so we better understand what they mean? both in the uh, clinical setting as well as the indication uh, screening setting. Uh, there are a lot of barriers to accessibility of genomic data that might help us accomplish these goals. And uh, uh, there's lack of diversity, as has been alluded to m most of uh, this morning. And then uncertainty about how to use PRSs and how to use um, monogenic disease variants in the clinic. And uh, the, the, the inertia that is often present in HCP uh, among providers and institutions. So uh, some research projects that could help is establishing okay, uh, our data commons. And then um, some of these challenges have been addressed before. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Bastarash. I'm a data scientist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And today I want to talk about an opportunity to start confronting or continue to confront this problem of variants of uncertain significance um, by leveraging some new data sets that we're getting access to now. This is a slide that was produced using the eMERGE Seq cohort. Um, of 25,000 individuals, 109 genes. And if you look at the publicly available data from ClinVar about the interpretation of these variants, you can see that the majority of them are actually variants of unknown significance or just not in ClinVar at all. And actually, based on the d discussion this morning, I took a look and found that uh, variants that are, uh, I'm sorry, individuals who are not white but are African-American, Asian, 
um, are much more likely to harbor these variants. So this does cause a, um, a problem, of course, with genetic testing. It also causes um, health disparity issues. So how can we confront this problem using a set of 25,000 individuals with sequence data and with electronic health record data? Well, we could, do, we could start a process, which Heidi Rehm um, discussed this morning, of reviewing charts of people who have variants of uncertain significance. Let's say somebody has a VUS in FBN1, for instance. We could chart review and see if they're diagnosed with Marfan's or maybe Ehlers-Danlos or a related disease. Or we could see if they have maybe a retinal detachment, joint dislocations, aortic aneurysm, et cetera. Um, the method that I'm going to be talking about is called the phenotype risk score, and it's an attempt to automate that process in a high throughput, shallow but very high throughput manner. And that is to extract those phenotype, um, the phenotypes that are known to characterize these Mendelian diseases and as assign scores to individuals. And this score indicates how close an individual is to matching the clinical description of that disease, as is described in OMIM. So, Prepare to be skeptical, right, because this whole process uses I ICD billing codes, actually, as the, um, the, the source for phenotypic information. So there's a lot of reason why you think this might not work. However, if you take a look at those variants, this is some preliminary data we very recently generated. If you look at the um, variants that are known pathogenic, which I put in scare quotes because, of course, that knowledge can shift and change under our feet. Um, and those variants that are known to be benign, and you look at the phenotype risk scores for a wide variety of diseases, you see that these boxes, which each represent an individual variant, are much more likely to be dark red for individuals who carry known pathogenic variants. What that means is for the upper row there, that an individual with a pathogenic variant in TTR looks like they have TTR amyloidosis. If you look at rare known benign variants, on the other hand, Individuals who carry those variants don't look any more like they have TTR amyloidosis than the average population. Um, so this appears to be a fairly robust and very rapid way to generate information about these rare genetic variants at the population level. So I propose that we create a new catalog of this information, of phenotype-genotype correlation with rare variants. Um, because this method only relies on ICD codes, it's very scalable, and I think that we could uh, create a resource that could really help interpret new variants that we don't know what the significance is. Uh, finally, since this is a planning session where we're supposed to think about the future, I'm going to dream a little bit and tell you about what I would love to do with this method. Um, currently, there is really a chasm of understanding between complex associations as represented in the GWAS catalog and the knowledge that's represented in resources like OMIM and ClinVar, which relates to Mendelian inheritance. Um, I think that the phenotype risk score could be used to sort of start to complexify a little bit the known Mendelian associations. We already know that there are some Mendelian diseases that somebody carries a variant, they're fine, they're fine, they get pregnant, all hell breaks loose, right? So it's really uh, almost a mathematical equation one rare variant plus some sort of drug, pregnancy, or some other event equals a high probability of experiencing some sort of medical condition. And I think because of the high throughput nature of the phenotype risk score, um, we're well situated to start exploring those, those relationships um, and, and discovering more potentially medically actionable information. So uh, I have 20 seconds left, but I'll just say thank you for my, listening to my TED talk. <laughs> Well, thanks to all of our panelists for great ideas and just as great questions that you all brought to the table. Um, I'm going to kick it off with the first question and then we'll open it up um, to folks in the audience. And I think um, one thing you all talked around and touched on in some ways was the idea of um, the different types of data that are coming in and in some cases the data that's standardized and the standards that we have for that data, but also um, potentially data coming from the clinical world or the real world that is not standardized, um, that we need to build standards for. And so um, one of the questions I had for you was, where can we look to be um, to the examples of standards that have been truly useful in taking data and making it actionable through our knowledge base? And where is there a need for additional standards development? Um, 
Well, I am not going to answer your question, but I'm going to add that <laughs> I think in addition to um, having standards, which is absolutely essential, um, I think we also need to think about what will motivate uh, people to share data. Um, and so what are the carrots and what are the sticks that are going to um, help from the clinical realm to get people to actually pool the information together. Because I think um, that it will be, even if you had standards, you will also need to solve that problem as well. Well, I think the example of standardization has been with the variant annotation and the ACMG guidelines. At least I think that's a start uh, to how to start uh, annotating variants. Uh, I think for the Polygenic risk scores, there's a ClinGen working group, Katrina and I are part of that, that's attempting to standardize the reporting. I think these are great uh, starts, and uh, as we know, these are, there's a lot of work still to be done, particularly variant annotation, uh, and, uh, but this is a good beginning. Uh, so I think we have a, a really good standard for uh, reporting variants in terms of, uh, you know, all the variants that you see in a human genome, right, this VCF format that, that has been developed a while ago, but in terms of summarizing the, you know, the five most important variants that are for, in a human genome, we don't really have a standard format for that. So I would say, you know, the, the sort of the clinical high, imp high importance uh, uh, a summary. Okay, I'll open up any questions um, on the crowd. Okay. Pink. Can't see the I had a question for it for if the car. Um, I I appreciate you uh, highlighting the importance of family health history, and um, we know that in the literature it really talks about um, the fact in some instances that family health history is primarily only taken at the first patient encounter and it's not followed up and so we don't gather any information from patients about um, occurrences and events in their families and you mentioned in your presentation about following up and the potential of um, longitudinal work in that area and I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts about how that might be incorporated into clinical practice. Well, I think simply getting the family history in the first instance has been a challenge, and uh, putting that in the electronic record, health record, and then linking it to clinical decision support, a lot of work has been done by Jeff Ginsburg in that area. And uh, the nice thing is that, again, um, it, it is dynamic in contrast to uh, your DNA because some sibling may develop a problem later. So I think the longitudinal aspect cannot be uh, ignored. But f I think we need to start with the basic, which is having a very well documented family history which is uh, there in a structured fashion so that we can mine it for all of these reasons uh, and then having a mechanism to update it as new events might develop in the family. I think that's an incredibly important area and I know NHGRI has funded a lot of work in that regard and, and, and Jeff's done a lot of work in that regard as well. He may want to comment. There's another question in the back. Uh, hi, I'd like to Oh, sorry. Do you want to directly respond to that? Yeah, I would just, uh, so a lot of the work that we've done um, and others have uh, created a, a patient-facing uh, and patient-enabled family history platform. So if we own our family histories, then we, don't, then we can continuously update that um, along with events that occur in, in our lives. And, um, and as uh, Iftikhar mentioned, you know, to integrate that data with the EMR using fire-enabled platforms and the like is something that uh, absolutely can be done and should be done. Thank you. Um, so great talks, everybody. I'd like to direct my comment and question to uh, Lisa, um, if I could. So uh, first, uh, excellent, wonderful method. Like it's so cool that this works with the large scale population databases to get more information about variants. Um, I think it's really smart. Uh, my question is about the slide where you showed the difference between the known and benign variants. It looks like on the known variants on the left, there were some boxes that weren't colored suggesting that there were patients that didn't have evidence of the phenotype of interest. My question is whether you've been able to explore that further to see if it was just missing data that wasn't captured by the ICD codes, if it was in the EHR, or if it was unrecognized symptoms. Is there any chance you can call them back to clinic and look for specific evidence of that disease? 
Awesome question. So there are a number of reasons for why a variant that is in actuality pathogenic doesn't appear pathogenic in this method. It could be that the information that we get from billing codes is so degraded and poor or missing that we simply missed the mark. Um, it's, I only have access to billing codes to generate that data, so I can't go back and chart review and see what I miss. Although I will say that something that, and this shows how devilishly tricky researching some of these variants is going to be, um, for some of the BRCA variants, it appears as though a number of people had actually already been diagnosed with having, let's say, a BRCA1 mutation. They had a bi bilateral mastectomy. And so they never developed breast cancer because they've already acted on that information. Thus, that variant didn't appear to be pathogenic in that individual. Um, so this just goes to show how, I mean, in some ways, I'm so glad for that person, but it's makes a, it unfortunately makes it really complex to start estimating things like penetrance of these variants and things like this as we start to get this information and succeed in getting this information to patients that they may act to prevent it. I will give another example that shows, I think, the success of the newborn screening program. If you look at people who carry pathogenic variants in PAH, they look no different than population controls. Because we find those patients in newborn screening and treat them appropriately so that they can grow and be healthy and normal like um, their unaffected counterparts. So in some ways, it's like our knowledge is becoming a new environment for these people that's changing the penetrance of the disease. So thanks for the question. So I just want to go back to Jillian, um, your first comment or question about standards. You, you know, I think for knowledge bases, standards is going to be in is already critically important. It does cost money to really develop these standards, but and you know we're trying to do this in the Global Alliance. But one thing we've recognized is it's one thing to develop the standard, but actually implementing it is when you harden that standard and make sure it works and evolve it. And so I think you know being able to invest in uh, in the implementations of standards to actually get them out there and use and instantiate them will be critical to really making sure that we can share data and, and benefit in our knowledge bases from a diversity of sources of information. Yeah. Uh, oh. Sorry, I'll take another question. Right there. If I were taller, I could see the name cards. But. Um, um, no, I, I also really liked, uh, Lisa, your, your presentation, and especially with the, the, the prospects of classifying variants of uncertain significance. And so I was curious as if whether or not you had looked um, at those variants that might have been a little bit more, a little less read in the VUS space. Like, have you crossed, crossed those with some of the functional assays that have been performed for, for example, for, for genes like BRCA1 or PPAR gamma? And then, and or like looked in an independent um, validation set to see how those variants that you might predict would be more pathogenic do in an independent testing data set? These are both good questions and good ideas. I think that we might, as part of a manuscript that we're preparing, we might actually look at VUSs that have high scores and try to somehow validate them with orthogonal data, maybe from the wet lab. I've, I haven't looked at the BRCA1 and BRCA2 functional assays, but I am really interested in looking at that. Currently, what I showed on the slide there was positive controls based on just best current best evidence of pathogenicity or, or, or ben, I don't know how to say benign <laughs> benignness. <laughs> um, um, so, um, but I think that there, there's a potential. I've also looked at um, SIFT and CAD and those types of predictive scores, and you definitely see a correlation there, but there's definitely places where the phenotype prediction deviates. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping, though, that this catalog of phenotype-genotype correlations can maybe be put out into the community so that others can, maybe through the ACMG guidelines, use that as one piece of evidence that could then inform the pathogenicity of a variant. Um, so I don't want to start adding or subtracting to the scores themselves based on orthogonal data points. I want others to be able to do that um, to, to in a more formal setting. We have, an question. I, we have an online question coming in. Yes, uh, this is a comment for the, the panel. Uh, with respect to variant interpretation, uh, suggest that NHGRI encourage research to ensure that we are interpreting interpreting variants properly in the context of uh, a screening population. The ACMG guidelines currently state that a likely pathogenic call should be made when there is a 90 to 99% certainty that a variant is pathogenic. Is a 10% false positive rate really appropriate in this context? 
The guidelines also state that the current variant interpretation protocol shouldn't be used as is for healthy populations. How will this be resolved at a society level and at the lab level? Um, so in the CSER consortium, one of the current activities that's taking place is what we call a variant bake-off, where we're having um, different groups um, interpret the same variants and then compare the results that they get. And I think going through activities like this can help us understand um, why people have a difference of interpretation and it just helps us evolve and improve the methods going forward. Um, and I think another activity through ClinGen has been um, supporting different combinations of labs in terms of resolving their discrepancies. And um, again, I think the more that we um, work together to try to understand why we have a difference of opinion in the interpretation, the more we can understand the nuances of how we're implementing those standards and maybe improve the standards going forward. So, so yeah, a, a couple issues there. So one being that, you know, across different methods that we've talked about, like SIFT and CAD and all these computational tools, they seem to agree on about maybe 80% of the variants, and then there's this 20% of the variants that they, you know, they conflict, have conflicting results. Um, uh, and, you know, I think it's a, a matter of looking more in depth into why, why that's happening. Uh, one of the issues that, that we've observed um, doing, you know, applying this AMCMG guidelines uh, to, to uh, you know, database of variants that we've observed in Arab populations is the allele frequency, right? So if you have one of the ACMG criteria is it has to be below 5% minor allele frequency. Um, and if you're using, let's say, uh, you know, uh, one population versus a different population, that, that it may be extremely rare in, let's say, Caucasians, but it's very common in Hispanics or in, uh, in Arabs or other, other populations. And until you have all that data and those knowledge base of allele frequency across the, the full um, global spectrum, you will frequently make those, those mistakes, right? Um, and and we, we've seen that. I mean, consortiums like EXAC and NOMAD have, have sort of made some progress towards that. But definitely, you know, a, as we have more, a better knowledge base of, 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 of allele frequency across not only um, eth uh, ethnic groups, but also within, you know, as I've shown, uh, within different ancestries, I think you will, you will probably get a better, you know, a, a better answer for that. But Katrina, I mean, I, but I feel like my interpretation of the question was getting at some of the stuff that was more in your talk, not about what about people disagreeing, because even if you guys agreed, there's still penetrance issues in other places where false positives and false negatives would come into play, and the shifting from looking in, in indicated populations to general populations of the impact of false positives and false negatives is known for all testing. But I, I thought that's sort of what I thought. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Maybe I misinterpreted. <laughs> but, but I don't know if you wanted to comment yeah. a little on that as well. I mean, I just Go had something you think. Let me, let me, so I think that's a really important question because um, when you're doing screening-based tests, a priori, that person has a very lo low likelihood of anything because they're walking about, they participate in a biobank. If you take a long QT pathogenic variant, the problems may be greater than less than one in a thousand. So a priori, Bayesian statistics will tell you that their probability of having a pathogenic variant is low. And we are actually, in eMERGE, we return likely pathogenics. And we found that, or at least preliminarily, that in the cardiovascular set of genes, the penetrance is pretty low. And so I think it's a really important question. What do you do with that 90 to 99% uh, you know, probability? I, I guess you have to do something. You have to either return them in a control setting, look at longitudinally you know, what happens to them, look at their phenotype risk score, look at their EHR, do functional assays. Otherwise, I don't think it'll make, we'll make progress. So we have to do that in, in that 90 to 99%. Did you want to have a question, John? Yeah, I, 
I'll say I, <laughs> I think we need more information to, to clarify what happens. And um, a lot of our current guidelines are written from the perspective that someone came to your attention because of clinical symptoms. And so that um, doesn't necessarily translate to someone who is asymptomatic or um, not yet diagnosed with a genetic condition because knowing that information sooner won't necessarily change what you do. You may still need to wait to see if they develop symptoms first before you would actually change their care. So I think that's, that's what I was trying to get at, that we actually need to conduct those studies and understand um, whether implementing those interventions sooner will actually make a difference for people. We, we don't really know that right now. I think there's a question in the back. I have a question for uh, Dr. Rodriguez Flores. Um, uh, actually, two questions. First is, uh, how easy or hard was it to get access to the Qatari genomic data? Um, and secondly, uh, what are your thoughts on how NHGRI should be working with the international community to really enhance the um, genomic knowledge base? Uh, so, so the first question, uh, it was uh, quite quite challenging uh, to get access to the data. Um, then, uh, at this point, they don't allow the data be uh, from from their large scale. I mean, earlier studies, we were they would send us the DNA to New York. We would sequence it there, and we could uh, use the data. Um, and we've shared uh, those genomes; they're on short read archive. Um, more recently, they're doing a, a large-scale genome sequencing project. They've sequenced about 15,000 whole genomes there. Uh, it was about a two-year process of the filling out an application, get, getting rejected, revising it, eventually agreeing on. You know, um, me traveling to uh, Qatar. Once I'm inside a certain building at a terminal where you know I have, I can log in. I can't uh, take a screenshot. I can't cut and paste. I can't uh, ins upload or download anything. I could get um, do an analysis where I got allele frequency for about 80 million mutations. Put that in a file. Then they spend a day making sure that I'm not stealing. Uh, any data, any protected data is in that file. Then they gave me an encrypted hard drive with, with the the file with just allele frequency in Qatar, and then I could leave the country with that. Uh, and, and that's the you know sort of um, the the state of the art. Um, so I think the but uh, now we have allele frequency for 80 million mutations in the Qatari uh, in the Arab population, um, and I think that um, you know getting that level of data is already very very valuable um, for for the t the type of work that we're talking about where we we're to want to establish okay is this a common mutation is it a rare mutation has it been observed before in healthy people or in affected people. Uh, you know, we, we could, we, you can do that, and, uh, and you know, and Qatar is just one of many countries that are now doing a very large scale, or scaling up the you know the genome sequencing efforts. Hi, this is like a part question, part comment. We were trying to add genetic test results to the patient's problem list. But then, at least in our implementation of EPIC, we found that you just cannot add, you know, text saying a variant was found, that you needed to have an ICD code associated to the result. Turns out, um, this is not really a diagnosis, so there is not really an ICD code. So we are in the situation where we got to find, like, a generic ICD code that means absolutely nothing, add that to add the text, you know, then the whole purpose of what we are doing was kind of lost. So what can we do to enrich ICD codes for situations like this? I don't know about the ICD part, but um, I become really interested in trying to leverage clinical genetic variants for research purposes. The amount of clinical genetic variants that are being returned and are part of people's medical records has grown exponentially if we look at Vanderbilt. Um, and a lot of these are VUSs. Um, and there's certain research questions that I think we can address with this data. So I've looked at my background's in NLP. So I've looked into trying to scrape medical records for just text mentions of genes and variants um, attached to patients' records. 
Um, fortunately, most of these gene names, you know, you're not going to say SMAD3 doesn't, you know, unless you're really talking about SMAD3, right? So they're actually, you can, you can do text processing to extract this information. I would say that on my wish list, um, second to having like VCFs attached to somebody's medical record, which would be amazing, is just have a pathology report or something like that that's actually in text. I mean, it's the PDF that's the problem. You can't text mine that thing. Um, so even if there was just a path report with the text of what variants were returned, how they were interpreted, and what panel was run, I think in terms of doing research and also, you know, it's beyond my scope to, to suggest it, but perhaps even surveillance of your patients that if they get a VUS, you know they had a VUS and you can actually find it in their record because it's text searchable would be a huge boon. Not the, not the solution we all want, but it would be very helpful. Question off to the side over there? Uh, no, it's a, it's a response to that. And I'll give a more detailed answer tomorrow after I can call my counselor. Um, but my counselors found this very clever code that is multi-gene picked panel run. And then on comment, she puts what it was. But I'll, I'll get for you the exact wording of it, but it's a code and it has a comment line. Thank you. Um, I, I think there are some folks here from the Ignite Network who can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe that one of the work groups in Ignite did actually work on um, getting some CPT codes developed and um, by actually sitting on the committees that are in charge and responsible for that system. And so that's a different coding system than ICD, but I think um, that is one way for uh, research consortia to get involved in actually changing what the coding systems are is to be involved in the decision making about those coding systems. So in the morning I mentioned the difficulty physicians have because they're overburdened and when you unleash more new technology on them, it doesn't always, it's not well received always. So I think it was Heidi or maybe Mark who made the comment of maybe divorcing from the EHR and putting on layers of apps. And I'm thinking back to the first cell phone I had and now the iPhone that I have and the difference is unbelievable. It was not NIH funded, that technology, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, it's, um, you leave it open to innovation. I, and I've, I have had trouble seeing how we will, you know, work with Epic and other EHRs to get genomic medicine translated. I really do. I mean, you're fighting. You're looking. You're asking us to invent a C, ICD code so you can put a genetic test result in the EHR. I mean, that is really sad. And I don't see how Epic will change. I think if we have these smart on fire apps and we layer it onto the EHR and we open it up to innovation then I think we'll see some progress. Come on over there. Yes, so to bring us away from Epic. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's the answer to anything. But, um, you know, I think that there's a, you know, trying to bring it to what we're, the ultimate goal and the opportunities for genomic medicine are, and that's really to improve patient health and the patient outcome. And in the previous se section on more of the disease kind of, diagnosis, and then this is the predictive, and it's so different, I think. And so what do you tell a, a person that hasn't been diagnosed with anything, doesn't have a phenotype, and I see this as an incidental finding type of thing. I think this is an area where um, LC could really come in and be of, of help here on what do you tell the patient, and how do you communicate that with the patient in a way that they understand, because risk and percentages and the polygenic, it doesn't even make sense to me. So, you know, when you're, you go to a patient off the street, what do you tell them? And how is this going to improve their health? I think is one area that we really need to concentrate on. I completely agree. Uh, comment in the back. Uh, no just a quick note on the comment about innovation and apps. Um, Obviously, in the real world app space, the cost of innovation for apps is privacy. Um, and so we want to think very carefully about that in the genomic space. Um, and certainly, that points to where um, uh, federal funding might be really appropriate um, as a way of preserving privacy while um, fostering innovation. 
Does anyone want to comment on that? Too? I mean, I, I think the other interesting question that stems from that is how already our understanding of privacy um, is changing over time and how the folks who are participating in genetics research expectations and interests are changing over time. And so I'm curious to know if any of you have thoughts both on that or about sort of future um, models we need to be thinking about with regard to data sharing, data permissions, data access, data control, data ownership um, in that space. Well, one option is to let the patient own the data and take it with him or her, and uh, but have mechanisms in place. I think some have proposed um, blockchain as one option, and you carry your record. Instead of some institution owning it, the patient carries it and takes it with them. They could even monetize it. <coughs> and they would um, you know, choose the mechanism that gets them the best security and privacy. Maybe we have to move away from large healthcare systems controlling and owning the data. Maybe it should all go to the patient who, who actually owns the data. Question in the back. Uh, can I, uh, having, having disagreed with Iftikhar earlier today, I, I have to agree with what he just said. The, in the pharmacogenetic space, there, the major challenge is what happens if somebody is genotyped at our place and then moves to, I always say Seattle, I don't know why, <laughs> and, and, and we know that they're a poor metabolizer for something. How does that information get transmitted? And until we have a, a universal health care system and a unified electronic medical record, it has to be the patient who takes charge of that information. I don't, I don't think there's any other way to do that. Uh, there are systems in Europe that, that, are, you know, that exist right now where people get their important pharmacogenetic data on a, uh, on a card that has a QR code, and the QR code allows any pharmacist anywhere to access a website that says what their genotypes are and what medicines they could or should avoid or not avoid. So I, I think for the foreseeable future, at least in the pharmacogenetic space, that the, the patient owns the data, has to own the data. Uh, as a follow-up to that comment, is there any evidence about how often, or does anybody know how often those QR codes get used or scanned or applied? No, I, 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 th this is all pretty new. There's, a, there's a, a very large randomized trial of pharmacogenetic implementation going on in Europe right now, and uh, it involves 7,000 people, and it's those 7,000 people who have gene cards right now. I, I, wish, I wish we had those at our place. Could I just comment on that? I, uh, yeah. Just to say that in, in uh, Thailand and um, in Singapore, a pharmacogenetics card with um, alleles that are relevant to uh, Stevens Johnson syndrome after carbamazepine exposure has virtually eliminated uh, that syndrome. Yeah, I think in terms of the you know portability, you being able to take your data with you. Um, I mean, there's there's two ways of doing that. One is you're walking around with a hard drive or a binder that has all your medical data, and you know that we don't want to have to have that. Um, but the other is having it all up in the cloud, right? So if you had, you know, where you would give a health provider access to, to your data, um, you know, the question is, is that a secure enough system uh, to do it? And is there, you know, do we have a, an open standard where we could say all electronic medical record systems need to have used the same API or the same open standard interface such that, you know, if I have, uh, if I have my medical records here, they're in one format, and then I move to Seattle, and maybe they use a completely different format or a completely different system, then, you know, the data, even if we, I do give them my medical, access to my medical records, they won't be able to read them because they're, you know, developed by a, a pri proprietary standard produced by another company that you know, has its own um, intellectual property. So you would need a, an, open, an open standard, right, and a secure uh, system for that. Yes, we have an online question. Uh, as a follow-up to Dr. Kulo, how do we incentivize the EMR, EHR industry to move innovation and collaboration between groups and databases? This is a huge issue because there is limited patient information, portability, and sharing. And I'm completely unqualified to answer that question, so I, I don't know, maybe others, but we, I mean, every, many people here are physicians, they work with the electronic, the electronic health record system is for documentation and billing. 
I don't think it's meant really to take good care of patients, and it is not at all ready for genomic medicine. We need a genome-enabled EMR, or we need apps. Otherwise, I see a lot of, you know, inertia in trying to accomplish what we are trying to do. Unfortunately, we have to work through the HR because that's the final common pathway if you're going to take care of patients. So I don't know. Mark seems to have the answer. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I don't have any information either, but I'm never shy about answering questions uh, despite the lack of knowledge. Um, it, to me, the, the recurring theme that I'm hearing is looking at the EHR as a solution when all of the, all the EHR is, is is a tool, and it's a very poor tool at the present time to be able to do what it is we want to do. And so I think there's a lot of um, interesting opportunities, but, um, you know, the focus, uh, and again, I, the concern I have is that given, and, have, and this is based on the experience that we've had in eMERGE through the last two phases of actually trying to do substantive things with the EHR, is that it's possible to do it, but it's not possible to do it in a generalizable way. We can all come up with, with solutions that can make the EHR work as a tool in our institution. And so I think it's, it's, I would be really reluctant to have a research agenda from NHGRI focused on, uh, you know, the underpinning of a generalizable EHR, because I don't know that that's going to come down the road. But I do like the idea that has been referenced a couple of times and I mentioned previously about the idea of how do we engage the patient more in this activity. To me, I think that's a rich and for the most part uh, unstudied area of how we can make the patients active uh, engage, uh, active engaged participants and drivers of change uh, in genomics. I think it's a really fascinating idea, and that's where I think the agenda needs to, needs to go. And again, we can explore whether or not the EHR can be an enabling tool, or at least not a disabling tool for that type of an agenda. Uh, but to me, that's where the, where the uh, interest is. Question? Dan? More of a comment. Uh, several years ago, we were struggling with EPIC and or other medical record related problems in getting patients who needed birthing plans, um, prenatally diagnosed conditions where they were going to potentially deliver at our hospital. Ultimately, they decided they're going to deliver somewhere else. And how did we get that information from point A to point B for the management of that patient's delivery? So they had motivation. They had buy-in. And it had to be portable. So we gave them the record, the old-fashioned way, papers. But that's not really an efficient process. But I think what we need to figure out is a portability and accountability of the patient in some way, shape, or form. And that's a place that certainly requires for exploration. Was there another question in the back? I, I really get all of what people are saying right now about this coming from patients and patient engagement. And I, mean, I, I live and work in Silicon Valley where people are extremely engaged and porting all of the things. But I worry about how that will massively amplify disparities. So, you know, how do we, how do we address both? How do we leverage the preferences and the input of patients who are our most important stakeholders, uh, while at the same time making sure we're not setting up implementations and systems that massive swaths of this country will not actually execute on. <coughs> Mark? I don't live in Silicon Valley. My high-speed internet is a Verizon modem. Um, we are probably as uncon in Danville, Pennsylvania, and probably as unconnected um, a place as can be. Um, and so again, I don't think we should shoot ourselves in the foot from the get-go of saying, well, it's going to increase disparity. I think the, what the NHGRI has done in calling for uh, a funding proposals is you have to include diversity. And in this case, that would be essential to be able to represent it's not just the high-tech people that are, that are going to be able to do this. You have to come to the table with a, with a population that it's not going to be easy to do this. And you have to demonstrate you can still do it, because we're seeing successes not only in this country, but in third world countries with the use of mobile devices and things of that nature. I think there's a great opportunity for research that, that a priori does not mean we're going to exacerbate disparities. The disparity piece has to be included as part of the research agenda. Patricia? 
So, and, and I think people kind of throw around the word patient engagement to mean many different things as well. And I've heard some things I'm not really comfortable with and things that I am really comfortable with. So I think that it's not about the patient, um, it's, not a, it's not the patient's responsibility, it's the system's responsibility. And to put that responsibility on the patient is just wrong. And I think if you engage patients that have live this system of not being able to get their records from one hospital to, to another in New York, across the street from each other. Um, you know, you can get an idea of what the problems are and what they're willing to do and not willing to do. And you have to take into account, I live in North Carolina. It's very different if you live in the Triangle area or if you live 30 miles out where my mother lives. It's a very different world. Patients are consumers, they're not going to be like me and want to do everything like that. And so it's really like you have to take care of patients. You don't, it's not the responsibility of the patient. Don't put the onus on the patient, but patients can help you do that. So it's very different. Question on the front. So, I mean, I think I'm going to come back to the, the title in terms of building knowledge bases. I think this has been a really interesting question, but I guess just to each of you, and you sort of did this in your TED talk, but sort of in a summary state, like from a perspective of what do we need from a knowledge base, what do you think is the most fundamental, infer you know, we've been talking more about how to get information into knowledge bases and the role of patients and all that, but what is the most, most impactful piece of knowledge in a knowledge base you think we could have that we don't currently? I think an accurate database of rare genetic variants and their phenotypic impacts would be would go a long way to help making genetic testing a more powerful diagnostic tool. So that would be what I advocate for. I would say penetrance and effectiveness of the interventions. <coughs> I'd say making data more accessible. It doesn't directly respond to your question. <laughs> but I think if you make data accessible, it will feed into everything else. Because you, when you make inferences about uh, risk scores or uh, variants, if you're powered by the data upstream, then I think you'll be more confident and your databases will be more robust. I've been really impressed with, by the UK Biobank you know, method of you, know, s you pay a certain number of dollars and you get that data. And, there have been some incredibly high impact publications in a very short amount of time. And I wish we had some similar methods so that we can access all the wonderful data that you have collected by funding, and then that would really instantaneously potentially lead to many new, uh, uh, new knowledge that would help us make these data uh, knowledge bases more robust. I would say uh, genomic uh, ethnicity to replace uh, self-reported uh, ethnicity in med medical records. So in, in, the, you know, in the case that I talked about, if you, any, any analysis that you're doing, such as carrier screening, if you're, if you're just making, assuming, making an assumption, an incorrect assumption about a person's ethnicity based on the way they look or the way they, where they tell you they're from, um, you're going to make, make substantial errors in terms of predicting their risk for a disease. Whereas now we have, we have the technology and we have the power to, to you know, efficiently and um, uh, determine their actual ancestry based on their DNA regardless of how they actually feel and then you could provide much better care in, in these situations. Can we have just one make, burning final yeah. comment on the panel for the very last minute? Can I just make one small um, endorsement of Katrina's idea of a database that has functional data with the variants? I just think that would be very important going forward. We have no further comments. Oh, okay. one more. No, no, I was just going to say, if, if we are done with everything here, I did want to just thank everyone for talking about theme number three. So we can thank all of our speakers again today. And then we will be going on to a break now for 15 minutes. So everyone has until 3.45. There will be some coffee and snacks out in the break area. And then please come back at 3.45 and we'll get started again for our last two